I guess what drew me initially to healthcare is because I think by integrating operations research in different fields, we were able to make a lot of progress. And I think in healthcare, there's still a lot of opportunities to apply tools from operations research to inform decisions. So I think it's just a very exciting space in general to be. Hello, I'm Lindsay Ekin, and I manage career services at the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University. Welcome to MSNE Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. Having an impact in improvements in public health is something that brings great meaning to Isabel Rao, who's recently completed her PhD with us. Her work is absolutely fascinating and is already contributing to discussions and decisions around healthcare policy, so I'm delighted to be talking with her about her research, which has focused on such varied healthcare topics as adherence to treatment protocols, smart and fair vaccine distribution, and moving the needle on the opioid epidemic crisis. Also, hearing more about what's next for her and this important area of research. Isabel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm curious where your interest in this impactful and meaningful work came from. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk a little bit about my background and what drew me to Stanford and research in, in healthcare. From an early age, I was always interested in science, and that, I think, came from my parents. My dad is a professor of mathematics at the University of Strasbourg. So when I was a kid, I remember he would bring me to his office, and it was kind of the ideal setting for me to ask questions when I was reading children's book on nature and science. And so you just like very simply explain different concepts in science by just drawing it on the blackboard. And I think the idea was just to spark my curiosity, like to draw my attention and make me more curious, which I think now fuels my motivation for learning. Mm -hmm. So I was, I guess, naturally inclined towards science. And so in undergrad, I did mathematics and physics in, in Paris at the Lycée Louis Le Grand. And then I, when I went to engineering school at École Centrale Paris, which I think now is called Centrale Supélec, I guess my horizon was broadened a little bit more because of the polyvalent engineers training that they offer in the school. And so in parallel to, you know, the core scientific courses, such as, you know, in mathematics or statistics, we also had classes in industrial engineering. And so that kind of opened my eyes to more applied sciences or applied mathematics. And that really sparked my interest in this because I wanted my work to have impact and not just, you know, be very theoretical and kind of abstract. And so I was very lucky in that school because they also encouraged us to have an international experience. And so then I applied to uh, master's programs in the U.S. and I got accepted at Stanford. So I actually did my master's uh, in the MSNE at Stanford. I guess I, I took a break from school because I didn't really have experience in the industry. And so I wanted to kind of have that before committing to you know, a PhD program. So I worked in consulting for two years at Cornerstone Research. So I learned a lot from that experience, just being exposed to you know, problems in industry and uh, what people are, are concerned uh, in that area. But I guess after two years, I wanted to be more challenged academically, I guess. And so I went back to the PhD program and I applied to a few schools and I I uh, got into Stanford, and I think what really drew me to the program was, first of all, I already knew the school, I knew the department, and met some of the professors. I also really wanted to stay in the barriers. But what really attracted me was the health policy track within the PhD program. And so it kind of allowed me to combine my passion for mathematics and for medicine as well, and also being able to have that impact that I was craving for in my research. We mentioned already those three main research projects that you've been working on um, with the treatment protocols, the vaccine distribution and the opioid epidemic. Could you tell us a little bit more about your research in those areas? Yeah, so my first project was in my first and second year. This project is a collaboration with Tel Aviv University. They had a collaboration with an insurance company, uh, Maccabi, and they had access to uh, electronic health records. So we had data for about 250,000 patients over 10 years. We were thinking, okay, some patients actually don't buy the medication that the doctor has prescribed, and this can lead to, you know, unnecessary healthcare costs, because then if they don't take the medication, the patients get worse and they might be hospitalized, and that's definitely something you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that can we design an intervention that is targeted towards the patient that we believe will not take the medication? Because, you know, having an intervention to all the patients might be costly, given that I think 
80% of the patients were actually buying the prescription for antibiotics. We looked mm. at specifically. We developed a machine learning model, and so we trained it using these large-scale electronic health records in order to predict which patients wouldn't buy the prescription. And then we coupled that machine learning model with the decision model to decide when an intervention to increase adherence would be economically warranted. And so using that model, we showed that we could you know, increase the number of prescriptions that would be filled. So I think we decreased the number of unfilled prescriptions by about 20%. And we showed that each year about $300,000 could be saved from healthcare costs due to higher levels of adherence to antibiotic medication. Yeah, that's a significant uh, amount. Yeah, that was a cool project just to be able to see, even if we don't have a perfect uh, prediction model, we're mm -hmm. still able to, you know, uh, reduce costs and increase the number of prescriptions. Yeah. Um, so then in my second year, this was in 2019, 2020, this is when COVID started. And so it was hard not to work on COVID when you know you're in the health policy track. And so my first project was about assessing the effectiveness of face masks in reducing the spread of COVID-19. It was kind of hard because there's a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of the pandemic. So we had to make a lot of different assumptions, but we performed a sensitivity analysis to kind of say, what effectiveness do we need the mask to be at in order to get the reproductive ratio below one for COVID. Mm -hmm. So then the debate kind of shifted around vaccine allocation. My advisor, Margaret Brando, she was on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the debate at the time was, how should the vaccines be allocated, given that we have a limited supply of vaccine? Yeah. So, yeah, so policymakers frequently have goals relating to individual and population level health benefits, but these goals are not necessarily compatible. So if you uh, want to minimize transmission, then maybe you want to vaccinate younger people because they're more likely to acquire and then spread the disease. But if you want to minimize death, then maybe you want to vaccinate older people because they're more vulnerable to the disease. Yes. So this kind of got us thinking, what should be the objective that you mm -hmm. should be considering? And also depending on the objective, then what is the optimal allocation? And so most of the models in the literature on vaccine allocation at the time, they were black box or simulation models. And so they don't provide a lot of insight into the problem and they lack transparency. So we really wanted to develop a model that is going to be able to inform decision making. So a model that would be interpretable and simple to communicate to policymakers. Mm -hmm. So what we did is that we considered, you know, an epidemic model and we then simplified it by approximating the disease dynamics. And so by doing this, we were able to derive an analytical solution to the problem. And this solution actually is a greedy allocation. And by greedy, I mean that it's an all or nothing allocation where vaccines are allocated as much as possible to one population group before allocating the remaining vaccines to the next population group. Yeah. So this was a simple model, but that allowed us to gain insight into the solution. Um, so it was very exciting to, to work on such a problem. Yeah. That transparency, I think, would have been so important during COVID. Right. And sometimes, you know, when the models are too complex, then you don't really know what parameters are affecting the optimal allocation. Uh, and so I think having this transparent model is really important, especially in, in public health, where policymakers are expected to be accountable for their decisions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a transparent mapping from, you know, the epidemic parameters to who gets the vaccine, I think it's important to communicate that to the public as well. And then the opioid crisis has been the third area of health policy that you've been working on. Right. So sadly, in 2020, the convergence of the opioid epidemic and COVID-19 has led to a significant increase in overdose death. I think last year there were more than 100,000 overdose deaths, which is the highest number of overdose deaths in one year in the U.S. And so this project was with Professor Keith Humphreys, who is a professor uh, at Stanford uh, in the School of Medicine. We're just trying to think of, you know, how to frame the problem and how to, you know, use mathematical modeling to provide evidence-based recommendations. This project informed the work of the Stanford Lancet Commission on the North American Opioid Crisis. Mm -hmm. And so this commission was launched in 2020 in response to the significant increase in overdose death. The goal of the commission is to understand better the opioid crisis 
in order to formulate recommendations for you know, reducing the number of overdose deaths. And so in that project, we developed a dynamic compartmental model of opioid prescribing and addiction in the U.S. We kind of separated individuals based on uh, their addiction state, their pain state, and whether or not they have a prescription for opioids. So we then use this dynamic compartmental model to assess the effectiveness of interventions that aim to treat addiction or to prevent addiction from happening. So we, I guess, had two categories for the interventions. The first one we called prevention interventions. And so as the name suggests, they're meant to prevent addiction from occurring by it could be reducing the number of prescriptions for opiates that are given. Mm -hmm. And then the second category uh, we call treatment interventions. They're meant to treat the effect of addiction, and so they reduce mortality rates. So this could be expanding naloxone availability, or it could be increasing access to pharmacotherapy treatment for individuals who suffer from addiction. Mm -hmm. And so what we found, which was kind of surprising, is that the treatment interventions are uniformly beneficial. So they increase life years and quality adjusted life years and also reduce the number of overdose deaths. But for prevention interventions, we actually found that they could cause harm to some individuals, so they have unintended consequences. Yeah. This happens because when you decrease uh, the number of prescriptions, for example, you also reduce the supply of pills that are diverted. Mm -hmm. And so some people who suffer from an opioid use disorder and don't have a prescription, they then might escalate to heroin because they don't have access to those pills anymore. Yeah. And so we see a short-term increase in heroin death because heroin is, is a lot more deadly than opioid pills. This was kind of a surprising result for us where, you know, you think you have an intervention that could help people, but actually you might have to wait longer to see benefits from them. Yeah. So that one has short-term problems, these unintended consequences, but long-term it's going to help. Exactly. Because then they can reduce the number of people who become addicted in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so you see a decrease in the number of people who suffer from opioid use disorder and heroin use disorder. And then in the long term, you will actually see a decrease uh, in overdose death. So the model that we developed predicts that about 1.2 million deaths are going to occur over the next decade, which is huge. And even with, you know, all the interventions that we consider combined, only about 26% of death could be averted. Mm -hmm. And so it's still, it's a lot of death. It's about 200, 300,000 deaths that could be averted. Mm -hmm. But even if we had all these interventions combined, there would still be about a million deaths that would occur. I can see how all of this work would be really meaningful. But even with all of this progress, I imagine that it's still difficult. You know, the widespread vaccination campaign is, is never going to be able to happen fast enough or get to everybody as soon as they would like it to. And then even these most hopeful models um, that you've developed with the opioid crisis, it's still a million deaths over the next 10 years that we'd still oh. see even with these good treatments. So how do you keep yourself feeling positive? So I guess the way I, I keep hopeful about this is by focusing on the people that we can help rather than the people that we can't help. What's been really encouraging to see is also how uh, policymakers are becoming more and more aware of the problem. And actually, the Biden-Harris administration released a report on national drug control uh, strategy last year. And the conclusion of the report were aligned with our results from our study, so that was really motivating to see. And they also announced that they would invest about $1.5 billion to help communities throughout the country that are trying to address this opioid mm -hmm. epidemic and crisis. And so some of the recommendations were expanding access to naloxone and mm -hmm. also expanding pharmacotherapy. So naloxone is an opioid antagonist that is meant to reverse the acute effects of opioids. Mm -hmm. So it can reverse an, an overdose, basically. And then pharmacotherapy involves medication like uh, methadone, ibuprofen, or naltrexone. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to help individuals uh, who suffer from opioid use disorder. So what is next for you? I'm going to stay in academia. In August, I'm going to start a postdoc at NCAD. And then next year in July, I'm going to join the University of Toronto. So I'll be in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering. It was an unexpected choice because I didn't decide until last year that I wanted to stay in academia. Mm -hmm. So when I actually started the PhD, I thought I would go back to industry. And I just wanted the PhD for the experience and the mm -hmm. journey. I didn't think about staying actually in academia and doing research. But last year I was at a conference with my advisor and we just started chatting about what I wanted to do for my final year of PhD. And she 
gently encouraged me <laughs> to go into academia. Yeah, so I guess I would give it a shot because I do like doing research a lot, but I guess I lacked the confidence to go for it. So I was on the job market and I got to meet a lot of interesting people and talk about my research. And it was really nice to see that there's this kind of increased interest for health. And I think that's partly due to COVID-19 and the impact it had on mm -hmm. our society. I really enjoyed meeting a lot of the different faculty members. So well, that's a big to... decision on where you go, as well as just following that path. And kind of as that path starts getting more focused with the different offers coming in, how did you choose which of those offers to take? Uh, that's a great question. It was, I struggled with the decision for a long time. I had a few offers, actually one in Europe, and I think the system is kind of different over there. Uh, I think what was important to me was to find a place where I thought they would value the research that I did because it's so interdisciplinary. It's like operations research and healthcare and a bit of economics and health economics. And so it was, it was important for me to find a place where they would value all of this. So for me, yeah, that was the main criteria. And then having the resources to support the research that I would do. Mm -hmm. So that could just be, you know, connections with the healthcare system, with policymakers, uh, or it could be just having people who I thought could mentor me while I tried to, you know, figure out how to navigate this new academic position. And then also having good work-life balance was important for me. I think that's something that I didn't hear a lot in academia, but I always ask questions about, you know, if they were able to achieve this good work-life balance. Location was also important for me because I'm an uh, international student and I wanted to find a place that would be culturally diverse as well, where I thought I could uh, thrive personally as well. And so, of course, you know, one of the many great things about a career in academia is that relative freedom to design and follow your own research path. So are you thinking you'll be continuing in this healthcare theme? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's something that's really close to my heart, I guess, healthcare. And I guess what drew me initially to healthcare is because I think by integrating operations research in different fields, we were able to make a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. And I think in healthcare, there's still a lot of opportunities to apply tools from operations research to inform decisions. So I think it's just a very exciting space in general to be. And I want to pursue my work on developing interpretable models to help decision making for policymakers. I think that's a very exciting field to me. So I talked a little bit about my project on um, of the opioid crisis, but the interventions that I considered, they specifically targeted opioid use, but I didn't consider the potential impact of broader policies such as you know, housing or uh, labor. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in looking at how homelessness can impact opioid use disorder uh, as well, and how policies that aim to improve housing, such as housing first programs, could mm -hmm. improve health outcomes in uh, that population. Yeah, nothing ever exists in a vacuum. It's always so many things coming together. Yeah, exactly. That sounds like absolutely fascinating research that can have a huge impact. I just wanted to wrap up to you with three questions I have that I ask everybody. The first one is your advice for someone coming into the program you just finished that someone might not have already told them. My main advice is don't be afraid to ask for help and reach out to people. Mm -hmm. I think when I started as a PhD student, it was kind of intimidating to email professors and you know ask about research or if you wanted to collaborate with them. But what I found out when I was on the job market is that most people want to help you and they're very open about it. And so you have nothing to lose just by shooting an email and asking about, you know, whether you want to collaborate with that person or you just have a, a general question about research. I found that most people are happy to help you if they have the time. And then secondly, your life maxim, that signature phrase of yours that you almost roll your eyes at yourself every time you say it, but it's also one of those truisms. So I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I've been a perfectionist ever since I was a kid. And so I have this advice that my dad gave me that kind of has stuck through my mind is that don't try to do things perfectly. And so I think that helps me because whatever I'm working on, I just tell myself it's okay to just start simple and have something imperfect and then it's easier to build up on it and then improve it over time as opposed to having an end product that's already perfect because that's impossible. I think that's especially true with research because there's no set end point mm -hmm. and any model that you have will always have assumptions. So you just start by 
doing something and then it's much easier to just improve it as you go. Very true. In a lot of areas of life, I feel yeah. like. And then finally, two books and a podcast. So two books that you think everybody should read, one of them MSNE related, or the other one just for fun, and then your favorite podcast as well. So one book that I think is MSNE adjacent, or at least is adjacent to my research on the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic is Dope Sick, which is written by Beth Macy. So it's a book about how the pharmaceutical company Purdue Pharma introduced opioid painkillers and how that kind of started the whole opioid epidemic in the U.S. So it started in the 1990s with doctors and pharmaceutical companies kind of convincing the medical community that opioids were safe to use and people wouldn't get addicted to them. And by the time it became clear that they were actually addicted, it was kind of too late because a lot of people were uh, addicted already. Mm -hmm. Another book that is not related to anything at all is a book called All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. Yes, I um, love that book. Oh, I'm so glad you do. So this book is set in the Second World War, mm -hmm. and it follows the story of two kids, two young people. One is a French girl who is blind, and another one is a German kid who is sort of a genius. And it's surprising in the sense that it's also positive, and it shows that even in these hardships, people still try to, you know, be good to one another. So I like that book. Yeah, very inspiring. <laughs> and then your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast was actually recommended to me by a friend. It's called No Stupid Questions. Uh, and so it's by Angela Duckworth, and she's a psychologist. So the idea behind the podcast is that Angela believes that there are no stupid questions. Mm -hmm. And she just likes asking people questions. And then she'll discuss these with her friends. Um, and it's just a fun podcast to listen to. Well, thank you so much, Isabel, for talking with us today about all of this. So I am sure we are all going to be watching really closely as to where you go, what your research comes back with, everything that we find out, and how policy changes as a result of that. Thank you for joining us for this episode of MSNE Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. This episode was produced and edited by me, Lindsay Aiken, with editing help from Jim Fabry. Our music was composed and performed by Catherine Barron, another student in our master's program. Please be sure to subscribe to us on Spotify or whichever platform you're listening through. And check out our website at msne.stanford.edu. It's msande.stanford.edu. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>